Good evening. I hope you've had a wonderful day today. Welcome to BVJ's Bedtime Stories. My name is Big Voice J, and this is a show where we get you ready for a great night's sleep with some old familiar stories that you haven't heard in a while. Links to every story can be found in the show notes at our website, bedtimewithbvj.com. Tonight we continue our story, The Stockbroker's Clerk, by author Conan Doyle. You may look well surprised, Dr. Watson, but it is this way, said he. When I was speaking to the other chap in London, at the time that he laughed at my not going to Mawson's, I happened to notice that his tooth was stuffed in a very identical fashion. The glint of the gold in each case caught my eye, you see. When I put that with a voice and figure being the same, and only those things altered which might be changed by a razor or a wig, I could not doubt that it was the same man. Of course, you expect two brothers to be alike, but not that they should have the same tooth stuffed in the same way. He bowed me out, and I found myself in the street, hardly knowing whether I was on my head or on my heels. Back I went to my hotel, put my head in a basin of cold water, and tried to think it out. Why had he sent me from London to Birmingham? Why had he got there before me? And why had he written a letter from himself to himself? It was altogether too much for me, and I could make no sense of it. And then suddenly it struck me that what was dark to me might be very light to Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I had just time to get up to town by the night train to see him this morning and to bring you both back with me to Birmingham. There was a pause after the stockbroker's clerk had concluded his surprising experience. Then Sherlock Holmes cocked his eye at me, leaning back on the cushions with a pleased and yet critical face, like a connoisseur who had just taken a sip of a comet vintage. Rather fine, Watson, is it not? said he. There are points in it which please me. I think that you will agree with me that an interview with Mr. Arthur Harry Pinner in the temporary offices of the Franco Midland Hardware Company Limited would be a rather interesting experience for both of us. But how can we do it? I asked. Oh, easily enough, said Hall Pycroft cheerily. You are two friends of mine who are in want of a billet, and what could be more natural than that? I should bring you both round to the managing director. Quite so, of course, said Holmes. I should like to have a look at the gentleman and see if I can make anything of his little game. What qualities have you, my friend, which would make your services so valuable? Or is it possible that he began biting his nails and staring blankly out of the window, and we hardly drew another word from him until we were in New Street? At seven o'clock that evening, we were walking, the three of us, down Corporation Street to the company's offices. It is no use our being at all before our time, said our client. He only comes there to see me, apparently, for the place is deserted up to the very hour he names. That is suggestive, remarked Holmes. By Jove, I told you so, cried the clerk. That's he walking ahead of us there. He pointed to a smallish, dark, well-dressed man who was bustling along the other side of the road. As we watched him, he looked across at a boy who was bawling out the latest edition of the evening paper and running over among the cabs and buses. He bought one from him. Then, clutching it in his hand, he vanished through a doorway. There he goes, cried Hall Pycroft. These are the company's offices into which he has gone. Come with me and I'll fix it up as easily as possible. Following his lead, we ascended five stories, until we found ourselves outside a half-open door, at which our client tapped. A voice within bade us enter, and we entered a bare, unfurnished room, such as Hall Pycroft had described. At a single table sat the man whom we had seen in the street, with his evening paper spread out in front of him, and as he looked up at us, it seemed to me that I had never looked upon a face which bore such marks of grief, and of something beyond grief of a horror such as comes to few men in a lifetime. His brow glistened with perspiration, his cheeks were of the dull, dead white of a fish's belly, and his eyes were wild and staring. 
He looked at his clerk as though he failed to recognize him, and I could see by the astonishment depicted upon our conductor's face that this was by no means the usual appearance of his employer. "'You look ill, Mr. Penner,' he exclaimed. "'Yes, I'm not very well,' answered the other, making obvious efforts to pull himself together and licking his dry lips before he spoke. "'Who are these gentlemen whom you have brought with you?' One is Mr. Harris of Bermondsey, and the other is Mr. Price of this town, said our clerk glibly. They are friends of mine and gentlemen of experience, but they have been out of a place for some little time, and they hope that perhaps you might find an opening for them in the company's employment. Very possibly, very possibly, cried Mr. Pinner with a ghastly smile. Yes, I have no doubt that we shall be able to do something for you. "'What is your particular line, Mr. Harris?' "'I am an accountant,' said Holmes. "'Ah, yes, we, we shall want something of the sort. "'And you, Mr. Price?' "'A clerk,' said I. "'I have every hope that the company may accommodate you. "'I will let you know about it as soon as we come to any conclusion. "'And now I beg that you will go. "'For God's sake, leave me to myself.' "'These last words were shot out of him as though the constraint which he was evidently setting upon himself had suddenly and utterly burst asunder. Holmes and I glanced at each other, and Hall Pycroft took a step towards the table. "'You forgot, Mr. Penner, that I am here by appointment to receive some directions from you,' said he. "'Certainly, Mr. Pycroft, certainly,' the other resumed in a calm tone. "'You may wait here a moment, and there is no reason your friends shouldn't wait with you.' I will be entirely at your service in three minutes, if I might trespass upon your patience so far. He rose with a very courteous air, and bowing to us, he passed out the wood door at the farther end of the room, which he closed behind him. What now? whispered Holmes. Is he giving us the slip? Impossible, answered Pycroft. Why so? That door leads into an inner room. There's no exit, none. Is it furnished? It was empty yesterday. Then what on earth can he be doing? There's something which I don't understand in his manner. If ever a man was three parts mad with terror, that man's name is Pinner. What can have put the shivers on him? He suspects that we are detectives, I suggested. Sit, cried Pycroft. Holmes shook his head. He did not turn pale. He was pale when we entered the room, said he. It is just possible that his words were interrupted by a sharp rat tap from the direction of the inner door. What the deuce is he knocking at his own door for? cried the clerk. Again, and much louder came the rat tat tat. We all gazed expectantly at the closed door. Glancing at Holmes, I saw his face turn rigid, and he leaned forward in intense excitement. Then suddenly came a low, guggling, gargling sound and a brisk drumming upon woodwork. Holmes sprang frantically across the room and pushed at the door. It was fastened on the inner side. Following his example, we threw ourselves upon it with all our weight. One hinge snapped, then the other, and down came the door with a crash. Rushing over it, we found ourselves in the inner room. It was empty. But it was only for a moment that we were at fault. At one corner, the corner nearest the room which we had left, there was a second door. Holmes sprang to it and pulled it open. A coat and waistcoat were lying on the floor, and from a hook behind the door, with his own braces around his neck, was hanging the managing director of the Franco Midland Hardware Company. His knees were drawn up, his head hung at a dreadful angle to his body, and a clatter of his heels against the door made the noise which had broken in upon our conversation. In an instant I had caught him around the waist, and held him up while Holmes and Pycroft untied the elastic bands which had disappeared between the livid creases of skin. Then we carried him into the other room, where he lay with a clay-colored face, puffing his purple lips in and out with every breath. A dreadful wreck of all that he had been but five minutes before. "'What do you think of him, Watson?' asked Holmes. I stooped over him and examined him. His pulse was feeble and intermittent, but his breathing grew longer and there was a little shivering of his eyelids, 
which showed a thin white slit of ball beneath. "'He's been touch and go with him,' said I. "'But he'll live now. "'Just open that window and hand me the water carafe.' "'I undid his collar, poured the cold water over his face, "'and raised and sank his arms until he drew a long, natural breath. "'It's only a question of time now,' said I, as I turned away from him. "'Holmes stood by the table, with his hands deep in his trousers' pockets "'and his chin upon his breast. "'I suppose we ought to call the police in now,' said he. And yet, I confess that I'd like to give them a complete case when they come. It's a blessed mystery to me, cried Pycroft, scratching his head. Whatever they wanted to bring me all the way up here for, and then... Oh, all that is clear enough, said Holmes impatiently. It is this last sudden move. You understand the rest, then? I think that it is fairly obvious. What do you say, Watson? I shrugged my shoulders. I must confess that I am out of my depth, said I. Oh, surely, if you consider the events at first, it can only come to one conclusion. What do you make of them? Well, the whole thing hinges upon two points. The first is the making of Pycroft wrote a declaration by which he entered the service of this preposterous company. Do you not see how very suggestive that is? I'm afraid I missed the point. Well, why did they want him to do it? And there was no earthly business reason why this should be an exception. Don't you see, my young friend, that they were very anxious to obtain a specimen of your handwriting and had no other way of doing it? And why? Quite so. Why? Um, when we answer that we have made some progress with our little problem... Why? There can be only one adequate reason. Someone wanted to learn to imitate your writing and had to procure a specimen of it first. And now, if we pass on to the second point, we find that each throws light upon the other. That point is the request made by Pinner that you should not resign your place, but should leave the manager of this important business in the full expectation that a Mr. Hall Pycroft, whom he had never seen, was about to enter the office upon the Monday morning. My God, cried our client. What a blind beetle I have been. Now you see the point about handwriting. Suppose that someone turned up in your place who wrote a completely different hand from that in which you had applied for the vacancy. Of course, the game would have been up. But in the interval, the rogue had learned to imitate you, and his position was therefore secure as I presume that nobody in the office had ever set eyes upon you. Not a soul, groaned Hyde. Not a soul, groaned Hull Pycroft. Very good. Of course, it was of the utmost importance to prevent you from thinking better of it, and also to keep you from coming into contact with anyone who might tell you that your double was at work in Mawson's office. Therefore, they gave you a handsome advance on your salary and ran you off to the Midlands, but they gave you enough work to do to prevent your going to London, where you might have burst their little game up. That is all plain enough. But why should this man pretend to be his own brother? Well, that is pretty clear also. There are evidently only two of them in it. The other is impersonating you at the office. This one acted as your engager and then found that he could not find you an employer without admitting a third person into his plot. That he was most unwilling to do. He changed his appearance as far as he could, and trusted that the likeness, which you could not fail to observe, would be put down to a family resemblance. But for the happy chance of the gold stuffing, your suspicions would probably never have been aroused. Hall Pycroft shook his clenched hands in the air, "'Good Lord!' he cried. "'While I have been fooled in this way, "'what has this other Hall Pycroft been doing at Mawson's? "'What shall we do, Mr. Holmes? "'Tell me what to do. "'We must wire to Mawson's. "'They shut at twelve on Saturdays. "'Never mind. "'There may be some doorkeeper or attendant. "'Ah, oh, yes. "'They keep a permanent guard there "'on account of the value of the securities that they hold.' I remember hearing it talked of in the city. 
very good. We shall wire to him and see if all is well, and if a clerk of your name is working there. That is clear enough. But what is not so clear is why at sight of us, one of the rogues should instantly walk out of the room and hang himself. The paper, croaked a voice behind us. The man was sitting up, blanched and ghastly with returning reason in his eyes, and hands which rubbed nervously at the broad red band which still encircled his throat. The paper, of course, yelled Holmes in a paroxysm of excitement. Idiot that I was. I thought so much of our visit that the paper never entered my head for an instant. To be sure, the secret must be there. He flattened it out upon the table, and a cry of triumph burst from his lips. Look at this, Watson, he cried. It is a London paper, an early edition of the Evening Standard. Here is what we want. Look in the headlines. Crime in the city, murder at Mawson and Williams's, gigantic attempted robbery, capture of the criminal. Here, Watson, we are all equally anxious to hear it, so kindly read it aloud to us. It appeared from its position in the paper to have been the one event of importance in the town, and the account of it ran in this way. A desperate attempt at robbery, culminating in the death of one man and the capture of the criminal, occurred this afternoon in the city. For some time back, Mawson and Williams, the famous financial house, have been the guardians of securities which amount in the aggregate to a sum of considerably over a million sterling. So conscious was the manager of the responsibility which devolved upon him, in consequence of the great interest at stake, that safes of the very latest construction have been employed, and an armed watchman has been left day and night in the building. It appears that last week a new clerk named Hall Pycroft was engaged by the firm. This person appears to have been none other than Beddington, the famous forger and cracksman, who, with his brother, had only recently emerged from a five-year spell of penal servitude. By some means which are not yet clear, he succeeded in winning, under a false name, this official position in the office, which he utilized in order to obtain molding of various locks and a thorough knowledge of the position of the strong room in the safes. It is customary at Mawson's for the clerks to leave at midday on Saturday. Sergeant Tucson of the city police was somewhat surprised, therefore, to see a gentleman with a carpet bag come down the steps at twenty minutes past one. His suspicions being aroused, the sergeant followed the man, and with the aid of Constable Pollock succeeded, after a most desperate resistance, in arresting him. It was at once clear that a daring and gigantic robbery had been committed. Nearly a hundred thousand pounds worth of American railway bonds, with a large amount of scrip in mines and other companies, was discovered in the bag. On examining the premises, the body of the unfortunate watchman was found doubled up and thrust into the largest of the safes, where it would not have been discovered until Monday morning had it not been for the prompt action of Sergeant Tucson. The man's skull had been shattered by a blow from a poker delivered from behind. There could be no doubt that Beddington had obtained entrance by pretending that he had left something behind him, and having murdered the watchman, rapidly rifled the large safe and then made off with his booty. His brother, who usually works with him, has not appeared in this job as far as he can at present be ascertained, although the police are making energetic inquiries as to his whereabouts. Well, we may save the police some little trouble in that direction, said Holmes, glancing at the haggard figure huddled up by the window. Human nature is a strange mixture, Watson. You see that even a villain and murderer can inspire such affection that his brother turns to suicide when he learns that his neck is forfeited. However, we have no choice as to our action. The doctor and I will remain on guard, Mr. Pycroft if you will have the kindness to step out for the police. How about that? Brothers doing bad thing, and only Sherlock Holmes can crack the case. Did you figure it out before he did? I know I didn't, and I'm here reading it. For better securities, try Fidelity Investments at 401k.com. No. 
I want to remind you that we are always on the hunt for great stories like this one to feature on the podcast. And if you know of any, please email me, bigvoicej at gmail.com. We're also on YouTube. we got a whole playlist of stories for you to enjoy over and over again. Go to tiny.cc slash bvjbedtime. Don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. It helps to spread the word that we're putting people to sleep every single night. Thank you so much for listening. Good night. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>